Hi everybody, I'm Dustin. I'm Anna. And we are not qualified to investigate the paranormal. But we may be as qualified as... The locals. Did I steal your line? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I okay. think we've been doing it that way. Very broken. We don't. Oh. Welcome back to the podcast where we forget how we do things. <laughs> Every single time. The locals. That's obscure. No, that's vague. <laughs> but it won't be after. That's the point. That, I love the it. Introduction. Yeah, it is. Cause, cause you guys all get it, right? Hold in. <laughs> get. It. I know what we're talking about. Uh, well, they do too because they read. Well, I don't know. Maybe they didn't say the title or the description. Depending, on, we haven't written any of that yet. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Because even if they read the title, they still wouldn't know that we want. Okay. Who are the locals? Who are the locals? At is really the question we're here to answer today. Keep listening to find out. In 20 minutes, we'll start talking about it. That's right. Nope, we're not one of those podcasts. Smash that subscribe. Yeah, no, we pretty much jump right in. We do. We do jump right in. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. If this is your first time listening in, welcome in. We have, we always have a special show for you, but tonight is particularly special. It's a hard word to say. Particularly? Oh, really? You're just going to go ahead and just say it, huh? Okay. I can say words good. Anna, the reason why tonight's episode is so special is because we recently took a trip back to see my family mm-hmm. in Northern Illinois, mm-hmm. specifically in Rockford, Illinois. Rockford, Illinois. Now, we weren't there for the most pleasant of reasons, but while we were there, we were reminiscing about when we used to live there. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to start doing some research on some places in Rockford. Now, we know that there are haunted places in Rockford because we've actually done a Rockford haunted tour before, a Rockford haunted bus tour. That was so fun. That was a lot of fun. Myself and Anna and my father went on a uh, haunted Rockford bus tour where we went to different places in Rockford with many other local, I think locals, to go see all these different haunted areas and take pictures and try to catch a glimpse of the paranormal. And I won't go into a ton of detail, but... I think what our listeners might be picturing with a haunted tour, even a haunted bus tour, is something in a city, like in downtown, where you just hop on. Well, we did hop on in downtown. Okay, we did. But I want you to picture a full-on tour bus with maybe 20 people scattered about, and you jump on downtown, and they took us way out to, like, corn... You're driving through cornfields, you're going to cemeteries, you're, like, out... We didn't... And we went to places... We just had no idea where we were going next. Northern Illinois, (laughs) for those of you who have never been there, is full of cornfields and soybean fields Mm -hmm. and hay fields, Mm -hmm. but mostly the first two. Mostly, yeah. You'll see like a farm with some livestock every once in a while. So yeah, we drove out. And what's funny is that we actually kind of lived out where we went to. So we kind of drove 20 minutes into the city. To go out near To go back out (laughs) where we lived at this time. weird. Anyway, so... I started doing some research, and I remembered the person who gave us our bus tour. She actually wrote a book. Kathy Cressall is her name. Mm -hmm. She wrote a book called Haunted Rockford, Mm -hmm. and she's the one who led our tour. And so tonight's story is actually one of Kathy's stories. Tell me a story. I'm going to tell you one of Kathy's stories. Tell me a Rockford story. In the quiet town of Rockford... Nestled on a picturesque bluff stood the Tinker Swiss Cottage, a Victorian mansion frozen in time. On a crisp autumn evening, Eleanor, an avid enthusiast of historical sites, joined a haunted Rockford bus tour, eager to explore the cottage's famed past. As the group meandered through the ornate rooms, Eleanor's curiosity was piqued by the intricate details that adorned each corner, a testament to the Tinker's family legacy. The tour, a blend of history and paranormal exploration, had attracted a diverse crowd. Some, like Eleanor, were there for the historical aspects, while others sought to brush with the supernatural. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the gardens, the atmosphere within the cottage grew palpable with anticipation. It was during the final leg of the tour on the old suspension bridge that Eleanor's encounter unfolded. Walking ahead of her group, she noticed a figure approaching from the opposite end. The woman, donned in a flowing white dress with her dark hair neatly coiled into a bun, seemed to belong to another era. Eleanor's eyes widened in admiration. The woman's attire was a perfect representation of the Victorian period. Eleanor nodded in greeting as they passed. 
The woman, however, did not acknowledge her, her gaze fixed ahead, as if lost in her own world. What a great actress. Super spooky, Eleanor thought. Super spooky. Yeah. Later, as the group reconvened, Eleanor casually mentioned the woman in the white dress to a tour guide. A hush fell over the group. The guide, visibly perplexed, informed her that no such person was part of the tour. Murmurs and uneasy glances were exchanged among the group, and Eleanor felt a chill run down her spine. The realization that she might have encountered a spectral presence of the Tinker Cottage's past unsettled her. As the bus drove away from the mansion, Eleanor gazed back at the dimly lit windows, pondering the mystery of the woman in white. Was she a remnant of the Tinker family's history, a lingering spirit tied to the cottage, or merely a figment of the imagination? The encounter at Tinker Swiss Cottage left Eleanor with more questions than answers, a haunting memory etched in her mind, blurring the lines between the past and the present. And that's the end of that story. So mm -hmm. I added some flavor. Mm -hmm. I added some names because there was no name. But this you added is the bus tour. Uh, no. Oh. This, this was, happened. Oh. this happened on the Rockford Haunted bus tour with Kathy Cressel. Wow. So the same bus tour we took. Yeah. We didn't go, well, to the, I don't know why we didn't go to the Tinker <laughs> Swiss. You know exactly <laughs> what you're about to ask. <laughs> why didn't we go to the Tinker Swiss Cottage? I don't know. I don't remember even knowing. Again, we didn't know where it was going to stop. Your dad yeah. might have known because he booked the tickets and he might have had an itinerary that we I don't think know. he knew. I think he was just like, this is something fun to yeah. do. Let's go do it. It was so yeah. different. Um, so we've driven by the Tinker's Oh, Cottage. numerous times. So many times. It's right there. Yeah. I need to pull. I want to pull a picture. Will we have? I'll put a picture. You can pull up a picture. We're also going to be watching some video evidence tonight. Mm-hmm and getting into some specific ghost hunting techniques that they use because at the Tinker Swiss family, wait, the, tink, the Tinker Swiss, is it the Tinker Swiss cottage? It's the Tinker family. It's, it's a Swiss, Tinker Swiss cottage. It's yes. the Tinker family Swiss cottage, but they call it the Tinker Swiss cottage. Yes, Tinker Swiss cottage. Welcome to the Midwest, folks. <laughs> I don't know if it's every week or every month they do a haunted tour where they allow amateurs to come in and stay. I don't know if it's overnight, but it's during the night and they give them EMF readers. They give them all kinds of different things to use to hunt ghosts and to try to communicate with the Tinker family that still lives there. So this emerged out of that. One of the, Somebody on that tour actually had an experience. Yeah, so this is, it's really hard to find the origin of when the haunting started at the Tinker Swiss Cottage. Yeah. Many of the employees there say that they've always had experiences, but I also, I'm not sure how long many of the employees there have been there. Okay. Right? And that's something we can talk about later. Yeah, because I'm already getting, you know, Stanley Hotel vibes when you say that. Yeah, no, so, Stanley Hotel for sure. Yeah. Um, and I'll get into what we mean by that if you didn't listen to that episode, but please do go back. It's a good one. So any other details about this story? Yeah, we have a history we're going to read. Okay. Before we read the history, I got a quiz for you. A quiz? Yeah. Is it a Rockford quiz? It is a Rockford <gasps> quiz, but it's a really quick one. Okay. It's a simple one. Let me preface this with, I lived there for five years with you, had no Midwestern life experience before that. I think you'll do good at this quiz. Okay. Can you tell me Rockford's nicknames? And the, actually, there's a bunch of Rockford nicknames. Yeah. Some of them are kind of unsavory. I'm talking about the ones where it, it's kind of representative of what Rockford actually did. And a lot of people actually refer to it as the blank city or the city of blank. I can only think of one. Okay. What's your one? Screw City. Bing. Yeah. Do you know why it was called Screw City? Because of the manufacturing of screws. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it, and actually, the city of Rockford really doesn't like that. Because they're, it doesn't sound... No, they're like, we should call it Fastener City. It's like, <laughs> nobody calls them fasteners. They don't get that things can be... <laughs> the council, the city council is very upset about the Screw City thing. Well, anyway. The Chamber of Commerce probably isn't because Screw City is fun and funny. Yeah. And then when you know, and all the logos I've ever seen with it have a big... Screw. Fastener screw yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it clarifies it immediately. And people know of it as an industrial city. Is, are there any nicknames that have to do with the lumber industry? Yes. And you should know this one. Oh. Wood City. <laughs> Where does the wood grow? 
Forest City. There you go. Yes. Forest, Forest City. City. I should know that one because there's a Forest City Brewing Company. Uh, I think there's Forest uh, City. There's there's Forest City other things. Yeah. Like the Forest City Dog Park. Yeah. Forest City. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Forest City Pet Room. Yeah. There's all yeah. like things. What about anything to do with the Rockford Peaches? No. Oh. Because they're that's they're not formally there anymore because the the women's league doesn't exist anymore. I don't know enough about that history, but. Rockford Peach is famous from a League of Their Own. Right. Yeah, that's that Rockford. That's that Rockford. Yeah. Uh, there are two other ones you missed. I admit, I don't even know. <laughs> so obviously... List, uh, list false. With, dude, can you change your quiz? Can you list the fake ones and I pick out the real one? Like, can you say either or? And I pick out which one's real. Okay, give me a second. Okay. Was Rockford once known as Furniture City or Brick City? <laughs> Brick City? Nope. Furniture, Furniture City. City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a store. <laughs> like, come on down to Furniture City. Yeah. Right? So it was fa- furniture manufacturing was a big... Right. Okay. Yep. And if you think about it, it makes sense because Forest yeah. City was because the logging industry was huge in Rockford yeah. when Chicago was first being built. Yeah. You've got lumber Spruce and, and you've like got screws. Yeah, right. yeah. You can build a frame for and anything. You can, you can make furniture <laughs> for sure. Okay. And here's the last one. That, that was good when you got me. Was Rockford once known as Reaper City or? <laughs> yes, you know now. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't go anywhere. It was once known as Reaper City. <laughs> Good try. I just brought yeah. that change on you. But... And can you guess why Reaper City? Reaper, as in the Grim Reaper. Kind of. But is it the tool? It's the tool, okay. specifically the automated tool called the Reaper, which oh. was invented in Rockford, Illinois. Okay. So we've got farm equipment, furniture, lumber, and screws. Yep. That, that really pretty much sums up my well, life there. That about sums it up. <laughs> yeah, I'll go along with that. Well, farming. I yeah. guess Reaper, Reaper is farming, yeah. Yeah. For mm-hmm. sure. Okay, so let's get into the history of the Tinker Swiss Cottage. Okay. The Tinker Swiss Cottage, a historic house museum in Rockford, Illinois, has a rich and unique history. Built between 1865 and 1870 by Robert Hall Tinker, it was one of the first houses in Rockford to have electricity before the 20th century. 1865 to 1870? Yep. I know why we weren't that interested in going there. Hold on. Okay. Hold that thought. Okay. Tinker was born in Honolulu to missionary parents and moved to Rockford in 1856, where he was employed by Mary Dorr Manny, the wealthy widow of John H. Manny of the Manny Reaper Works. So oh. they actually created these the Reapers. They made them there. It's all connected. Inspired by his travels in Europe, particularly Switzerland, Tinker built this 27-room, two-story Swiss-style cottage on a limestone bluff overlooking Kent Creek. The house features high ceilings, an angled roof, unique designs, and a spiral staircase made out of a single piece of walnut wood crafted by Tinker himself. How do you do that? It's Forest City. It's Furniture City. I know. How do you not do spiral that? Staircase Why did we not make more furniture when we lived there? That's one of the only things we didn't do. We had <laughs> animals, we had a garden, we had farm equipment to work with, and we had jobs. Sure. There weren't any of those things. We did have jobs. <laughs> In 1870, Tinker married Mary Dorr Manny, and they became one of Rockford's most influential couples. Tinker was not only the mayor of Rockford, but also a founding member of the Rockford Park District and the CEO of Major Rail Lines. After Mary's death in 1901, Tinker remarried her niece, Jessie Dorr Heard Tinker. We just started collecting names after that. That was just, anyway. Wait, after his wife died, he married her niece? Yeah. Okay. They adopted, what, you got a judge? I mean, if I think about it, like, if you died and I married one of your nephews, think about that. It's a different time, on That would be weird. <laughs> I, I know. Obviously, I have to reserve judgment on cultural, historical things. Welcome to the Midwest. Everybody makes fun of the South, but... Yeah. Oh, no, that's... Niece. Yeah. That's... They adopted a son, Theodore Teddy Tinker, in 1908. Upon Robert Tinker's death in 1924, Jessie partnered with the Rockford Park District, allowing her to remain in the house until her death. After her passing in 1942, the Rockford Park District acquired the property and opened the home as a museum in 1943. The Tinker Swiss Cottage was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1972, further cementing its significance in American history. 
Today, the museum contains all of the original objects belonging to the family, offering a vivid glimpse into the past and the lives of the Tinker family. Wow. So this is one reason why it is considered a very historical place, because it is somewhat frozen in time, in that most museums or most houses that have been donated then have collectors and curators go through and find pieces that would fit in the house at the time. Yeah. This was all preserved by the Tinkers. From they, what era? Did they you gave say? it nineteen hundred, uh, early nineteen, uh, from eighteen sixty-five. So all of the stuff that's in the house was the original stuff that was in the house when the Tinkers lived there. And they had a, how long did they live there? And when they uh, eighteen sixty-five, did... and then Jesse passed away in nineteen forty-two. And then it became a museum in 1943. Okay. I'm trying to imagine. So in comparison to your family's farmhouses. Right. So why don't you go ahead and say why we weren't <laughs> interested sorry. in going to the Tinker Swiss Cottage. And it's not that we weren't interested. We just probably didn't even think about it. We saw it all the time. But we lived in a house that was finished in 1860. It was built between 1861, I want to say, and 1866. Yeah, I can't remember that exactly. This is your, off, yeah, off your great grandfather's home. Yep. That he bought from the family that built that it, he but he didn't buy it until. Ooh, when did he buy that I house? I was going to say, they, they did, they put the first in bathroom in it. Or something like that. Okay, how long had they lived there? They had already lived. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. But when they were married, they bought the house, or he bought, he bought the house. Ooh, I don't remember. Okay, so that. I yeah. should know all this. It's got to be the 20s. Let's just say it yeah. was the 20s. Um, Before the Depression. For yeah. Sure. And then they went on to stay in it, and it was still lived in by then. Who moved in? Oh, the, yeah, fam, other family members. Like, it's never not been lived in by family members. That's right. And so I'm thinking about at what point would the furniture from the 20s have been changed? Because I know, we know. We threw that... away all of it. No. <laughs> as soon as we took over, we were like, get this old get furniture out. out of here. It's just such a different mentality when you're living in it and you're bringing families in it, even though it stays in the family, even they weren't in a preservation mode. They weren't in a, con like, let's keep the house, let's restore it and keep it. And by they, I mean, like, your great-grandparents. They put a bathroom in in the 50s. Yep. That changed that, what was the dining room completely. There goes the first effort at, you know, keeping any rooms the same as they originally were. Right. And then the kitchen, we know, has obviously been completely updated, but... That's just baffling to me. I mean, yeah, I love that idea. And we always talked about how can we make this house a little more original. And we did. Restoration. We did something. We ripped up. We ripped up some carpeting. Layers and layers of carpeting and linoleum to get down to the original and, hardwood. And lead-based paint. And paint. Somebody painted the floor somewhere along it the way. It was my great grandfather. He yeah. painted the floors. Yeah, of his, his own cheap house. Of his yeah. own house. Yeah. Yeah. So quit giving him such a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I just now I really do want to see the Tinker Swiss Cottage. I had no idea it was so preserved. Yeah, I, and I actually have a list of reasons as to why people think that this place is so haunted. There you go. Because again, I had a really hard time finding the origin of the first stories that were coming out of this. From what I could see, it's not like this place has always been haunted. It seems like as of late, now it has been haunted always. Say that again. <laughs> it seems like as of late, now it has been haunted always. <laughs> That's revisionist history, is what you're talking about. Like I'm not saying that. Like, okay. I'm saying that it seems like, as uh -huh. of late, it may have always been... Wait, it has... What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> you said, as of late, it may have been haunted it, always. It may have been haunted always, yes. <laughs> I stick by that. I'm not saying it's revisionist history. I'm just saying okay. that that's what it seems like from what I can find. Now, we haven't been on a tour, and we haven't talked to tour guides or people who are historians that area. That's not necessarily true. My father is actually kind of a historian of the area, but he's not necessarily an expert on Tinker on the Tinker Swiss family. Yeah. Tinker On the Tinker family, the Tinker Swiss cottage, specifically. Yes. yes. Although he could probably tell a story. He probably would know stories. Right. Yeah. So do you want me to go through some of the reasons and experiences as to why, like, these are some of the common experiences that people have in the Tinker Swiss cottage? Yes. Unexplained voices. There have been instances where visitors and staff heard unaccounted voices. In one incident, during a group tour in the Red Room, participants heard a woman's voice calling, Hello? from downstairs when everyone was upstairs and the doors were confirmed to be locked. Physical sensations. Visitors have reported feeling touched or sensing a presence near them, despite there being no one visibly present. Auditory phenomena. Reports of hearing children playing, whistling, and humming 
have been common even when no children were present in the cottage. Sightings of full-bodied apparitions. There have been multiple accounts of seeing full-bodied apparitions in various parts of the cottage. This includes the story that we just read. Objects moving. Some visitors have claimed to witness objects moving on their own or finding items in different places than where they were originally kept. One of the stories that I've heard is during a daytime tour, a rocking chair just started rocking. And the Rockford Red Hat Society or the Red Hat uh -huh. Club? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they were like on, on a tour and they witnessed that happening. And how many people? Uh, I don't know Those how many. Details. I don't know, four? <laughs> I just need yeah, a number. Say a number? <laughs> No, I don't need a number because it doesn't matter how many people saw it. <laughs> so those were some of the examples of what happened. What what does happen? You have a question? I do. Oh, okay. Does this make you just jealous? Of what? <laughs> that we spent five years living in a house the same age and nothing like this happened. No, because I don't think nothing like that happened. I agree with you. And I'm going to... We'll talk we'll about We'll talk that. about that. Yeah. But here are some of the reasons why these things might be happening, specifically at Tinker Swiss Cottage. Historical significance and preservation. So we kind of talked about this. The cottage has been preserved almost exactly as it was during the time the Tinker family lived there, complete with their original belongings. This preservation of the Victorian era setting, including clothing, furniture, and personal diaries, may contribute to a sense of lingering spirits or energies from the past. Who, uh, who, said, who wrote this? I, mean, I did. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Location and construction. The cottage is built on a limestone bluff overlooking Kent Creek. Limestone and water are often considered conductors of paranormal activity in popular ghost lore. Additionally, the area's history of Native American presence may also contribute to the supposed hauntings. That is true. There is a mound on the Tinker's family land. Oh. Yeah. And I think it was dated to 1000. Oh, so this is like pre Black Hawk. I don't. Oh yeah. Who the? D okay. Wait, I don't. I don't know. Just people. Okay. Uh, you know, my dad would probably. He know. would know. Okay. Yeah. Questions for him. Reported paranormal experiences. Over the years, visitors and staff have reported various unexplained occurrences. These include sightings of apparitions such as the mysterious woman in white, unaccounted voices, physical sensations like being touched, and auditory phenomena like children playing, whistling, and humming. That is actually listed as one of the causes because, as you and I have talked about so many times, priming mm -hmm. is a thing. Yes. So what's the priming effect here? You're going on a ghost tour uh -huh. of a cottage that yes. has Victorian era artifacts in it. Yes. Well, yeah, well, that's a, that's a self-selection too. So if the, the Red Hat Society wasn't on a ghost tour, right? but they can be implicitly primed toward schemas around ghosts to being in a house that historic, for that, that preserved and everything in it like that. And, and even not just that it's like, oh, it looks old, but if there are plaques everywhere, pictures everywhere, photographs of the people, you're thinking about dead people. Does that make sense? You're not just like, oh, all this stuff looks really old. I am consciously thinking about people who are now deceased. Mm -hmm. And so that just activates such a huge okay. schema. And so that's, I think, one one huge factor for the potential not, priming but, on yeah. the ghost tour, uh, or on the non-ghost tour. But the ghost tour is obvious. Yeah, that's self-selected priming. <laughs> The last part here is the one that I find the most interesting, media attention. The cottage's reputation for being haunted was amplified after it was featured on the television show Ghost Hunters. Such media exposure often increases public interest and reports of paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's the one I find most interesting. So I actually have some, it's not just Ghost Hunters that went there. There were several other shows that have been there, including our good friend Jack Osborne and his show. So if you remember with our skinwalkers, shapeshifters, yeah. shapeshifters episode, Jack Osborne claims to have seen a skinwalker. Yeah. So I've only seen this Jack Osborne guy from that one clip and he, it was like night visions. I don't even remember yep. what he looked like, but yeah. I mean, not... Jack Osborne is Ozzy Osborne's son. Oh, it's the same guy? Yeah. Okay. Who else would it be? Some other guy named Jack Osborne. Are you serious? It's probably not that uncommon of a name in the UK, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> Oh, my mind is blown. You didn't, so you didn't know that was Jack Osborne, no. Ozzy Osborne's son, the first time we watched. No, you just thought they he gave. He looks different from. You just think they gave him, I guess, some dude to show. 
who's Zach Baggins? I mean, he, he wasn't the guy from Ghost Adventure. Right. He wasn't anybody before that. He's not really anybody now. Uh, <laughs> I love him. I love Zach Baggins. I I'm going out on, I am, I am going out over the air here and saying that I do. I love Zach Baggins. That show that you didn't like, I, I started watching it again today. Right. I, people don't know who he is and no one knows who he was before. Zach Baggins he... is from Ghost Adventures. Yeah. He's the host of Ghost Adventures, yeah. although I think they're done now. It's a travel channel ghost yeah. hunting show. I was saying, I thought Jack Osborne was just another dude named Jack Osborne. No. This, yeah. And so, you thought that, okay, so did I tell you the celebrity guest that he has with him for the Tinker Swiss Cottage? Did Jenny McCarthy. So how would he get Jenny McCarthy? It was just some dude named Jack Osborne. If his show was really popular, uh, she's not like A-list anymore, if no. if ever. No, no, okay. Anyway. <laughs> I, uh, not to be bashing on celebrities here, but I'll do that sometime. I'm, I'm, I'm floored. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so Jack Osborne went there. Lots of people have gone there. I also have some videos of local paranormal investigators going into this house mm-hmm. and, and looking at it. So... Uh, I'd like to show you those now, unless you have, you want to jump into any one particular thing that I just talked about. Do you have any questions for me? I mean, what do you want my input? I mean, there's so many things to talk about here. I think most of it you would say would be priming. I guess I would like to hear what you think about location and and construction. So the idea that there are certain materials on this earth that might hold energies a little bit more than others. Energies is an incredibly vague term. It's what could that mean? I mean, I think when you're talking about the first law of thermodynamics, right? Energy can either be created or destroyed. The idea is that you and I just create us sitting in this room talking, and there's a brick wall behind us. It's taking in some of our some we're we're causing energy to happen that's being absorbed somewhere. Yeah. Does that ever manifest itself in the same? echo later or does that echo itself yeah. later kind it, of thing it kind of gets me thinking about people who are into minerals and and rocks of yeah different, exactly. you know and and, and pyramids yeah <laughs> i don't know but i i match all those things together it's oh, like if okay. you if you worship pyramids like the people who like who think that pyramids have energy and stuff like that I don't know inter- oh like oh you should put a pyramid over your desk kind of yeah thing? yeah yeah the shape of a pyramid yeah. has power okay right. i'm talking more about like no i get who you're talking about the people who believe that if you have soapstone that that will bring you good luck or something like that yeah or like was it is it hound's tooth the one that's supposed to help us sleep that i think yeah. is really pretty it's really a beautiful rock yeah um and i just love the i just love minerals and rocks for their beauty aesthetics mostly um, and their texture, and they're really great to, to experience. But I think it's an empirical question if different rocks and minerals and substances and interacting with water, as you say, this is... And water. Water. Right. Yeah. If they have different biochemical properties that might impact human experience. Because that's the basis for all of these, you know, put, put this rock under your pillow and you'll sleep better or rub this and you'll feel better. Limestone makes you hallucinate. Okay. And that to me, no, I don't, is, I don't know. If I that's don't know. True. That would be like an empirical question because if it does, then it goes into the realm of toxins and toxicity and chemical exposure, and we and we talk about possible biological bases for a perceptual experience, which haunting would be or seeing an apparition. So I think that's really important to to rule in or rule out. And that kind of goes back to the, the EVP piece we were talking about yeah. in that episode. Of there are audiology spe- experts, there are chemists there are geologists there are people who certainly could go into do substances like limestone have some sort of chemical property that could influence perception right or if what the premise here being that it holds energies over time like the imprint of an event that happened in the house or a spirit could would this be a place where the veil between the spirit world and the human world is thinner because of that rock i don't know that's we don't have the tools to assess that i will go back to the same thing i always say when it comes to making claims like that like these substances have always been associated with haunted areas well then you're making claims for things we just don't have the science to assess so right i would say that you and i are a good test case because we lived in a house completely made of limestone it was Mm -hmm. built in mid 1860s yeah so from a personal perspective that seems like bullshit right (laughs) And then the other side to this is that, you know, that, well, people have li- like have died in this house. People have died in our house, too. It, what did it they was, say? That's what, that, that's what people did back then. They lived in, they were born in yeah. houses and they died in houses. There weren't a whole lot of hospitals in the, uh, the old Midwest in 1860. Yeah. So guess what? That's where you were born and that's where you were dying. Yeah. What is it that they say, like, st- statistically on average like if you live in a house that's older than i will have to look up know. that date if you if you live in america in a house that's older than this point 
and I will look up the date for you guys. Someone probably passed away. It, it, there's a greater possibility that someone died in your house. That's an interesting piece to me. And I think it probably is early 20th century and earlier, which isn't that common to live in anymore because so right. few of those houses still exist. But again, coming from people who we ourselves have lived, not just in what I've lived in multiple houses mm -hmm. older than the 1920s. Oh, myself included yeah. in that because we lived in Baltimore. We lived in Baltimore City, yeah. yeah. Um, I think this might even harken back to Copenhagen and our discussion about yeah. people who live in places that have a, a lengthier historical imprint maybe have yeah. the, mm -hmm. the modern Western American suburban life just doesn't have as much contact with historical places. Yeah. And might and so we tend to probably be more susceptible to believing in that. Yep. And so on that note, I want to go back to something interesting that you said during my last reading, not psychic reading, but actual reading. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> when you were like, why do you think that never happened to us? And oh. I said, I think it did. And you go, I think it did too. Uh huh. Let's, let's talk let's about talk that. Let's talk about that. Because that goes back not so much to living in a limestone house. It doesn't go back so much to living in an old house. It goes back to the fact that these floors are not level. <laughs> Uh, it's the most mundane thing, but I, I so I talk about biological explanations, right? Chemical exposure, mm -hmm. it, it's super mundane explanations like the floors aren't level in your house. That could explain a rocking chair rocking mm -hmm. on its own. That could explain items going missing or being mm -hmm. moved, rolling down a piece of furniture, rolling off onto the floor and going disappearing. Something that that's just the most mundane explanation for that. And I think the creaky f sounds. Uh, oh the yeah, creakiness, the sounds we often the sound heard. of children giggling or whispering or whistling. Oh, you've got pipes. You've oh, got God. pipes. Everything. First yeah. of all, pipes that were not included in the original construction of the structure. Yeah, and people who now we're talking about people touring a house who aren't used to experiencing right? that. Not only that, but I know Chicago is called the Windy City. <laughs> it's it's got nothing. It. On, it's got nothing, nothing on Rockford. On the plains of Rockford. Yeah. When when yeah. that wind blows, it is. It, a 60 mile per hour gust, it's crazy. Yeah. And the tor tornadoes come through. And tornadoes talking, come like through. When the yep. gusts come through, it's it's like the Wizard of Oz on an everyday basis on those days, seasons of the year. So before we watch these videos, I do have two examples of my own from our house. Mm -hmm. um, one is late one night, I was downstairs watching TV. I think he must have been upstairs in bed. And I heard like a tink, 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 like metal hitting stone. Tink, mm. tink, 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 tink. I was like, what is that? So I wake one out in the kitchen, it got louder, ding, 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 ding. And I was like, look at it from behind the toaster, there was a, a knife that oh, had yeah, fallen behind the, the toaster uh -huh. and had a little bit of butter on it. Ding, and the little mouse, the little ding, thing ding, was ding, ding. ding. <laughs> but it was, it was so cute. I took a video of him. Yeah, I know it's great. I was like, gross, there was a mouse in your, in your kitchen. Yeah. I got to tell you something. We lived around a cornfield. And after harvest, the mice are going to get in your house. Yeah. Luckily, we had two cats that mostly took care of the problem yeah. for us. But every once in a while, we'd have to set out traps, and we yeah. would. We also tried to be very clean again. Well, there was that one time that we had a knife, and you know, it, a butter knife on the cat. Yeah, butter knife behind the, the yeah, whatever. Yeah, that fell behind the the toaster, and we just didn't know it was there. <laughs> Cute little guy. Yeah. The second time was we did have friends over one time, and we used to have kind of a setup in the basement where we had like a family like, room in the basement. Yeah, rock band or mm -hmm. something like that. So we were down there playing, and our friends were like, "What was that?" And they looked over in the corner, and I was like, what was what? And they're like, we heard an old man coughing over there. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we, you and I looked at each other, and we're like, it's an old house. Like, yeah. And it was right over by where, like, the plumbing was. Yeah. And I was like, where the where the main drain for the house is. And I was like, who knows, man? Any... Somebody could have flushed the toilet upstairs. I mean, I think we were all downstairs. But I was yeah. like, anything could have happened, you and, know? Yeah. And we were also all drinking. There's no... There's no... <laughs> oh, yeah. We were, like, <laughs> heavily <laughs> drinking that night. Yeah. It was, it was cold. It was co so cold outside. But things like that would happen all the time. And honestly, a lot of these videos, when I watch them, they're a version of an EVP. And I was like, I've heard that sound before. It's like the creaking of an old hinge, right? Yeah. Because a lot of the doors we have in our house are the original doors. And I... they have the original hinges. And they have the original door knobs, those funky door yes. knobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. It's like very preserve of the type of hardware they would use on yeah. doors and stuff so like that say, or construction, I guess. But... Yeah. Although I said that the house had been updated in some ways, so much of it hasn't. It's right. It's just like this mixture of, of unique, preserved, yep. tiny things like doors and hinges. and yeah. yeah. And so these are all sounds that we have heard so many times before just living our lives in a house yes. that was built in 1860-something. Okay. So let's look at some of these videos. Okay. So I'm watching Jack Osborne? No, 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 no. Not yet. Okay. We'll watch him in a second. First of all, this music is terribly mixed. Here, so they go through like a tour where the guy's telling them all the things, basically all the things I told you already. Oh, look at that wood. Yeah. That unpainted. 
Oh, wait, that's beautiful. It was recorded in a Black Midget 3000s. Okay, so they're getting set up for their investigation now. Is that going? The thing I'm going to do is turn this on. This is actually an EM pump. And a lot of people think that electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic energy are tied in with spiritual energy. So what that is going to do is that's going to set off kind of an, a, like a magnetic field. So he's setting an E, what is it, an EMP pump? It's an EM pump. So it's an electromagnetic pump. Okay. And so I looked that up because I was like, well, that's interesting because now you're just injecting a whole lot of crazy pump radio noise. wave, no radio waves okay. into the environment. Okay. And so an EM pump, depending if you get the the paranormal ver the paranormal hunting version, I think it's four kilohertz or four hertz up to what was it? The the range I don't think is auditory. You can't hear it, but it does hit the ghost frequency, which is what we talked about. Was it last week or two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And one and another thing where you know we talked about how if you know driving. Oh, it was la it was during the ghost hitchhiker thing. Okay. So it's the ghost frequency is 18.9 kilohertz or hertz yeah, or something that, like that. It's, 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 and it makes your I'm eyeball shake so you hertz. see things. So this is pumping that kind of frequency into, into a the room. into the room. Yeah. Well that there you go. So this is all like that that oh my gosh. Yeah. Like we're hitting on something that we can yeah. really really that, that And we will. People, I think we need to do something specifically on devices and on these devices ghost hunters, but this is this is a good start. or intentionally yeah. causing a perception of an experience. It's so right when they're saying we're trying to detect well, it, we're trying to use this as yeah, as equipment it's, to detect what actually we're inducing. Something. It's not any different than priming. No, no, no. Yeah, right. it's just doing it. It's artificially doing it. it you know, it's adding to it. It's like a magic trick to me. Though. Yeah, it's like a magic trick. Like yeah. I'm gonna, you know, I'm just causing this to happen to get you to perceive it. Okay, so they're putting that on, and I want you to watch this. Not this guy's journey, but the other guy's journey. Now turn the lights out. That's a beautiful room. I'm again. I'm oh yeah, this, this is really does look worth. It's touring. amazing. Yeah, <laughs> the architecture in this place is amazing. Okay, this guy. I want you to watch him. This is gonna test us, isn't it? So they feel the need to keep all the lights off. But then they're gonna make really loud noises. Is there a rationale for that? The obelisk is a a tool with over two thousand words built into. So that piece of shit is called an obelisk. Mm -hmm. That is an electronic device that takes readings of the room and has a dictionary of 2,000 words where it then produces words based upon what it's sensing in the environment. What it's sensing? Mm-hmm. So it's a random word generator. I don't think it's random on it. It's oh. taking readings from the environment. 2,000 is a super small vocabulary. It really is. <laughs> it really is, and you're absolutely right. Like I think it's a random. A dog? Dogs can speak 2,000 words? They detected that they can understand. Oh, really? really? Remember that dog that we watched the dog. 60 Minutes about it? I think a dog can understand as any as many words as you can teach him. No, that the Border Collie that the yeah. psychologist was teaching. Yeah, I know what you're talking language. about. His language, his vocabulary was over 2,000, I think, because he'd been mm. trained, but maybe it was like under 1,000. Okay, well, I want you to pay attention to this obelisk <laughs> and what happens as they go along. So if this machine picks up anything in the white noise, it'll just tell us right off the bat what it says. Can we open this door? That was it. Sounds like a creaking floor. <laughs> was that you trying to talk to us? No. Yeah, I can see how you fall asleep to these videos. And that's where I'm gonna stop. Thank you. <laughs> so, that one guy that I asked you to kind of follow his journey, if you were watching him have those symptoms, is there anything specifically that would pop out in your head as to like what might be going on with him? Barring that he's maligning or performing. Right, um, yeah, let's say he's not. Uh, some anxiety, stress reactions, some panic sensation. Not a full-blown panic attack, right. um, but definitely... Yeah, close to it. Yeah, yeah. So he got close to him, he's like, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. He's like, I gotta get out of yep. here. Then he could, he just yeah, kept yeah. repeating himself, he couldn't stop repeating himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. Well, As, I mean, really... He was saying he didn't feel good, and like his stomach starts sweating this in the stomach, and then he's saying his chest hurts and Got chest pains. Yeah, and he was he was scared. Yeah, he was scared. He was just scared. Yeah, in general, he was very scared. He was probably not the most qualified to investigate the paranormal. Right, and that's and, that's the thing yeah. is, I like a lot of these paranormal investigators, they get so they scared, just get so scared, yeah, and they just run out. Yeah, um, and he didn't. He stayed. And, you know, he tried to continue on with the investigation. Yeah. Kudos to him. But at that point, you're not objective anymore. Right. 
you're just scared. Then you're not aware. And you're going to jump every time you hear a pipe bang or every time you hear a mouse scurry across the floor. You're going to think that it's something that's paranormal. Right. And there is no investigatory field aside from this one where you say, I feel afraid. So that is evidence. You would say, I have really intense feelings. I can't stay objective and do an investigation. Whether right. it's law enforcement or science yeah. or any other area where we do investigations right. or, yeah, you, you just would say, oh, I'm not objective. Or you would be aware. And in fact, they're going in the opposite direction of me being non-objective is the evidence. My inability to stay objective is the evidence for the thing I'm looking for. Right. I'm okay. afraid. So there's a ghost here. Inherently problematic. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's the longest that I'm going to make you watch anything. And <laughs> folks out there, I don't recommend you watch it. You can if you want. I'm going to put the link in there, but it is very long. And not a whole lot happens. Yeah, there's it's just a guy having a hi like highlight that they have all this equipment, and at the right. earliest point, they're like, they're the most. He's the most freaked out by the creaky sound. It's not the equipment going off that seems to freak him out the most. It's the creakiness of the house. Yeah. It's the things that we were just describing, right? That this, live with for that you just years. live yeah. with. That when you leave, it, and they're saying like, there's no one upstairs, and this kind of goes back to the exact location and the stories yeah. you were saying. People saying, I hear your voices upstairs. No one's up there. If you came from just up there. You have impacted that level yeah. of the house. Yeah. Because you have to remember, like, if you it's walk, it's constantly yeah. settling. So if you were in another room and you hear something from that room, it's probably the remnants of you having been in that room. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> you shook things. You moved the house. And the other thing. It's all connected. Right. And the other thing, like, when I heard the tink tink going on in our the kitchen, kitchen, I didn't run away saying, a ghost has a knife. You know? No. I went in and I was like, what the hell is that? You, you know investigated what I mean? like, objectively and you found the source. Yeah, because it possibly could have been a burst pipe, let's be honest, and it was all house. Yeah, and that's what we were actually always keeping an eye out for. It wasn't ghosts. It was when is this house going to break on us? <laughs> right. And we're not going to have heat in a right. sub-zero temperatures. And you right. have, you, we were kind of living like pioneer people who, they weren't super scared of ghosts. They had better things to be scared of, like yep. real threats to survival. So let's watch more interesting ghost hunters like uh, uh, celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> This is really quick, too. It's only in a minute and 23 seconds. Fun. There's Jenny McCarthy. There's Jack Osborne. Is it weird to be excited? No. It's the name of the game. It's the name of the Let's game. To All be right. unobjective. <laughs> My name is Jack. I am Jenny. Okay. And that was just a glimpse into their entire investigation. Might be the most interesting clip from that investigation. Oh. I'm not sure. <laughs> but... Uh, what they were using is a thing called REM pods, which actually reacts to disturbances in the EMF field around it. So they're potentially it's part of that field just by standing near it? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. And also all of the lights and also everything else that's going on around it. If there is a fluctuation at the power plant that causes it to go from a certain hertz to a different, like to even decimal place over on hertz, which happens all the time, that might make it go off too. That's that's my supposition on that. We need to we need to do a whole thing on on just equipment alone. Would this have anything to do with the wiring in old houses too? One hundred percent. Okay. Yes, and as you know, the wiring in the old house that we that the wiring in the old house that we lived in was pretty much redone. The original copper stuff was stuff covered in paper. Copper stuff covered in paper, which, which is a they tinder box. Right. Yeah. It would catch on fire all the time. Yeah. That was the big thing with it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's there's one example. So we we really do need to talk about equipment eventually, but for now we're just kind of yeah. This did turn into examples. kind of a digression on equipment. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, this is an EVP. It sounded like a, a whistle from a phone or like it, a, an alert on a phone. It didn't sound like... It sounded like a whistle. A voice to me at all. No. It sounded like a creaking something. It was like a bell. It was like a ding dong. And so ding this dong. is this is what they think it's saying. Who's those guys? Who's those guys? It doesn't sound like words at all to the naked ear. No. It sounds like a yep. bell, a tone. Yeah, a, it's very a, like... Electronic like, Electronic, yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's see, I have one more here. Oh yeah, this was just kind of a fun thing, but... Do you want us to never return? <laughs> All right. Dowsing rods? Dowsing rods. <laughs> Dowsing? Dowsing, I don't even know. Dowsing. Okay. They go back here. So this, this woman right here is one of the, one of the folks who leads the paranormal investigations at the house. She continually uses dowsing rods. That's the big, that's the big thing there. And her point that she's talking about right here, I'm not going to play this whole thing, but it is kind of a fun video to watch, and I'll make sure that you you all can watch it. It's from WQRS. 
um, which is one of the local stations around there. They did like a Halloween special there. And so they went around, they talked to people and they, you know, they do some fun stuff. But I started looking at the dowsing rod thing and they were like, well, the tinkers were from 1860. So when you bring all these electronic equipment in here, they're like, you know, when you have these ghost hunters who are like speaking to this radio, the tinker Swiss people are like, what is that little box? It's a great point. Right. So what's a technology that they would understand? Dowsing rods, which isn't a technology at all. But dowsing rods are basically two metal rods that are bent at a 90 degree angle that you hold. One end is longer. The shorter end you put um, in between your thumb and the padding of your thumb uh-huh. on both sides. Mm-hmm. It was originally used, uh, that's also the other word for them is divining rods. It was originally used to find underground water sources. Right. So the idea there is that when you walk over a water source, things will cross, you know where to dig your well. Right. We went on a haunted tour in Milwaukee where they had us use those. Oh, did they? I don't remember them having oh, to use those. We were in the basement. Yeah. I think I got to hold them. And I'm thinking, we're in a basement. Yeah. There's water underneath There's water us. Yeah. <laughs> so when it starts moving, I was like, I think there's a reason they have us do this in the basement. <laughs> but it doesn't actually work for water. Oh, it's not it? even sensitive to water at all. No. Oh, yeah. I've seen some stuff on that. Uh-huh. When I was in A school uh, for the military, the master chief who was in charge of our A school came out when we were doing uh, premise wiring, which is basically the ability to wire like telephone underground and everything. He's like, you can find these conduits by using dowsing rods. And he brought out two dowsing rods. And so it was between him and another chief and the chief called bullshit on him. And she was like, there's no way this works. And sure as shit, it worked. Every single time we walked over it, we were here like spinning around, having blindfolded people spinning them around and it still worked. For detecting metal? Right, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Oh. It doesn't do anything. It oh, doesn't do it anything. Just... It is 100. percent It doesn't do any micro movements of what oh, you're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what the other when I was like, anything's happening here. It's because we don't. We're standing on uneven right. surface, and they use them in out nature, and they're yeah. always going to move because you're not on flat surfaces. Right. That's why I made sense to me at the time because it was like, oh, these are metal rods. Uh, you have all this wiring underground that's creating a mag- magnetic field. They're going to move. Uh-huh. It makes sense to me. Uh huh. That's not what was going on. It was just completely all in our head. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. The power of suggestion right. or priming. So it doesn't even work for water. And there have been studies done on it. Uh, I think I found a study from 1971, or maybe it was a book that was written about how these things don't work and how it's, I can't remember the name of the psychological effect that I sent you, but idio something. Yeah. It's just a long term for micro movements of our body, right? Idiomotor phenomenon. Yeah, a long term for it. If you see their hands while they're using these things and talking, you can kind of see little micro movements that they're making, right? Nobody stands completely 100% still. Right. So yeah. your movements are going to cause it. And I've actually watched a video where she's doing it and they're like, and she can't move it because there's no way she could do that. Why isn't there a way she could do right, that? Right. She's holding it with her hand. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you can move anything you're touching. You're always moving. Yeah. It's idiomotor phenomenon. We are in constant motion. Yeah. When I teach mindfulness, it's the practice of stillness, but there's always, it's getting still enough to notice the movements that your body's doing even when you don't try. Right. Because guess what? Breathing. Yeah. That's a movement. It's <laughs> moving. You're always moving. Yeah. Well, Something there, there are, yeah. I don't know, even we would, we would just call them, yeah, your entire sympathetic nervous system is just involuntarily your autonomic nervous system is taking care of you all the time right your heart is beating it's moving yeah those movements that energy is being absorbed by this brick wall which will then eventually expel it and make (laughs) people think that our ghosts are still here in the south after we have died yeah oh i think we touched on so many aspects of haunted houses of traditionally haunted houses we didn't go into i'm making up a term for legacy haunted houses where people who live there repeatedly saying that it's haunted so we'll we'll we're not done with haunted houses just because we've done tinker swiss cottage right there's there are other pieces of phenomena for people who either live in quote haunted houses or who've been haunted in their lives right there are whole tv shows for right people who've experienced hauntings and what what's going on with those people yeah yeah maybe we'll have to do that one next because that the reason that we started this podcast is actually because of a story like that, that yeah we'll talk to you about I didn't, it's about a, an individual who's haunted not a place. Yeah. I'm excited. Okay. This was really fun. Yeah. It makes, I want to take a tour of the house. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a follow up. Yeah. And, and what I want to be able to check in on, cause you, I forgot about this part was the tie back to the Stanley hotel. Right. Because as you said, recently this house is being covered more as yeah. a haunted house and right. it hadn't been before. And so there's a huge priming effect to that, but I want to see how much has that impacted just if you go on a regular tour at 8 a.m or yeah. if you have very limited tour hours are those tour guides perpetuating stories too oh 100. i'm sure born? they are okay but we'll have to go and find and, out yeah, yeah i want to go and find out because really i like historic tours just 
because these houses are beautiful. The furniture, and there was a Davenport oh, yeah. in one of those videos that the was Davenport. The Davenport, as as your grandmother would have called it. And that's what so she would have called it. Ornate wooden yeah. couch with beautiful velvet furniture. There's stuff to be appreciated that I think we're missing out on when we when we go to just see a haunted house. That's there's yeah we're really missing out on opportunity to respect history. Yeah. And the people who live there. Yeah. And built it. Yeah. And spent their lives. Yeah. And loved and laughed. All we care about is their death. And passed away. Why? And there's an honoring in that, not not yeah. to be scared of that. That's a yeah. Well, for me it wouldn't be I wouldn't be scared of it. I'd be like, What what's over there? What are you still doing here? You know? Oh yeah. Well yeah. I think I think there's an element of of oh boy, that's a that's a whole lot. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's a whole other right episode. Of, of but, death and uh, right. we are need to probably we'll just do an episode on death. <laughs> That's right. But the paranormal aspects of death. Mm -hmm. We'll never be ready. No. Not for death. It's part of life. Final thoughts. Um, thanks for bringing us back to Rockford. Yeah. We were just there. I think our intention was actually to record while we were there. Yeah, we, we didn't that. We didn't make it. Yeah. But that's okay. Because we will be back there again. Yeah. And we will be back there and go see the Tinker Swiss Cottage. And I'd like to do the Haunted Tour as well. I'd like to do both. Yeah. We have recorded an episode from the house, the family house yeah. from the 1860s. So maybe that'll become a historic register <laughs> location someday too. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Okay. Well, yeah. everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this trip down memory lane with Anna and I, as well as just a trip into a haunted house mm -hmm. from a great city in Northern Illinois. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the third largest. It doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway. A great but lesser known. <laughs> right. The great but lesser known city. And actually, I think another nickname it's known by is Second City. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. Those are the three that I should have remembered. I don't know why city, I didn't have it on Second my list. City and well, now you can add Forest City. And now you can add, yeah, Reaper City and Furniture City. Furniture City. Yeah. All that's, the industries. That's my favorite. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening in. And we'll see you next week. Bye.